want to talk to a staff member about taking your next step towards Christ, just visit us on the web, stonescrossing.com. There you'll find a connect card. Simply fill it out and someone will contact you. If you are new to our church, we also have more resources available for you on our website. We're excited about what God is doing here at Stones Crossing Church, and we want you to be a part of it. I look forward to meeting you real soon. My name is Pastor Scott Luck, and I serve as lead pastor at Stones Crossing Church. Thank you for joining us, whether you're watching online or gathering with us in person. And while we're grateful for the technology that allows for watching our services online, we also know that life change happens best through life on life discipleship. And that's why we offer a number of opportunities from classes, Bible studies, and small groups so that every person can build friendships and grow in their relationship with Christ there's a place for you here to connect and grow at Stones. If you have questions or you wanna to talk to a staff member about taking your next step towards Christ, just visit us on the web, stonescrossing.com. There you'll find a connect card, simply fill it out and someone will contact you. If you are new to our church, we also have more resources available for you on our website. We're excited about what God is doing here at Stones Crossing Church and we want you to be a part of it. I look forward to meeting you real soon.
everyone, my name is Pastor Scott Luck and I serve as the lead pastor at Stones Crossing Church. Thank you for joining us, whether you're watching online or gathering with us in person. And while we're grateful for the technology that allows for watching our services online, we also know that life change happens best through life on life discipleship. And that's why we offer a number of opportunities from classes, Bible studies, and small groups so that every person can build friendships and grow in their relationship with Christ. There's a place for you here to connect and grow at Stones. If you have questions or you wanna to talk to a staff member about taking your next step towards Christ, just visit us on the web, stonescrossing.com. There you'll find a connect card, simply fill it out and someone will contact you. If you are new to our church, we also have more resources available for you on our website. We're excited about what God is doing here at Stones Crossing Church, and we want you to be a part of it. I look forward to meeting you real soon. Good morning, Stones Crossing. I'm Lee Harper and I serve as the missions pastor here. If you're new to Stones, we're so glad you've joined us this morning and we'd love to meet you. So be sure to introduce yourself to a staff member in the lobby. If you're a first time guest, make sure you fill out one of our connect cards and drop it off at the info counter or a giving box in the back of the auditorium. The connect card is located in the seat back in front of you or you can fill it out on our church app or at stonescrossing.com backslash new. We also have a welcome gift for you that you can pick up at the info counter. Speaking of the Connect card, even if you're not new, there are other reasons to fill one out. Do you have a question about one of our ministries? Maybe you've moved recently and need to update your address, or you might have a prayer request. The Connect card is a great way to communicate with us. Whether you're new to Stones Crossing or you've been attending for a while, we have a place for you to get connected. If you'd like more information about joining a Bible study or small group or details on membership, baptism, events, or serving, go to stonescrossing.com to learn more. You can also connect with us on Facebook or Instagram. If you have questions, please reach out to a staff member. We're always happy to help. Psalm 63, 3-4 through says, Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Church family, let us lift up our hands and voices as we worship God this morning. Well, good morning, church family. It's great to be here with you this morning. Great to see the sun shining outside finally. So let's stand and let the, the sun shine in within these walls. i 
pastors here at uh, Stones Crossing Church. I just want to welcome you guys here this morning on this awesome, sunny, beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, just really one big, huge announcement, and it is that summer camp is coming. I'm uh, really, really excited about this. We are less than two months away from our middle school summer camp. So we're going to be headed back to Camp Allendale. Uh, just beyond thrilled and excited in preparation as we have been praying and preparing for this week uh, for our middle schoolers. So if you guys have upcoming 5th through 8th graders, you guys are more than welcome to register them to join us 
Uh, we are well past halfway full, so it is now. Now is the time. I expect we're going to close registrations probably the second week of May for this week. I'm just excited for what God is going to be doing in the lives and hearts of our students. Now, about a month past that, in the first month of July, uh, we are heading back to CIY with our high school ministry. We're going down to Tennessee. We're going to stay at Lee University. Uh, just really excited to go on back. We're going to take a coach bus, head on down. Um, and it's just an incredible week for us to just connect, uh, spend time in God's word, build strong community. Um, and I'm just so thankful for the time that we get while we are there. So if you guys do not have students, there's still something I need from you guys. Please be praying ahead of those weeks, praying for our students, praying that God would just speak into their lives and that they would just set their eyes directly on him and want to follow him for the rest of their lives. So guys, thank you so much. We are so thrilled that you guys are here this morning and please stand as we continue in worship this morning. was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It wasn't my turn Till I met See, I was breathing I was breathing but not Alive and all my failures, I tried to hide. It was my turn till I met you. Sing it out. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. Now your mercy. Your mercy has saved my soul, and now your freedom is all that I know. Lift it up, the old made new, the old made new. Jesus, when I met you, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, but you called me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, and your love is the air that I am breathing. I have a few Oh, my name. 
it's mine today that Jesus Christ has won. So I can face tomorrow, for tomorrow's in your hands. And all I need, you will provide, just like you always have. I'm fighting a battle, you've already won, and no matter what comes my way, I will overcome, I don't know what you're doing, but I know out those truths and to know and find rest in the fact that you've already won the battle. And so help us to find peace and joy and comfort in those words and in that truth, Lord. We just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace and mercy, Lord. And we just pray for this time that as we dive into your word, that you would just help us to open up, open up our hearts, open up our minds so that we can receive your word and that you can speak directly to us and to our souls, Lord. And I just pray for Keith that you would just let your words flow through him um, as he delivers it this morning. We 
thank you that we get to gather together and worship your name. Um, and to you be the glory, Lord. We love you. We praise you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. Well, good morning. My name is Keith. I get the privilege of bringing you uh, the message from God's Word this morning. I'm one of the pastors here. And uh, let's just start out. Notice the picture in the back there. I want you to imagine this is your front door. It's 6 a.m. on Tuesday morning, and there's a knock, and the doorbell rings. And then after you figure out who's going to actually answer the door, then uh, you go to the door, and, and you peek through the side window there just to see who that is because you had to turn the light on. And you look and you're like, that, that, it looks vaguely familiar. Could it, could it really be? And then you're like, okay, well. And so you open the door. Now some of us would open the door and say, it's really early, could you come back later please and we'd close it. But let's say you open the door and there would be a, a few different reactions that people might have. One would be they just kind of look, look down. Another reaction, some people might grab him and give him a hug and say, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. But then you invite him in and say, please come in. Why, why are you here? Why are you here? And his response to you is, I came to spend the day with you. I want you to do exactly what you do every Tuesday. Just let me follow along with you. I I'm there with you. And we're like, well, that'd be great. And then we're like, uh, wait a minute, this is Jesus actually here with me. And we start going through our minds, oh, well, let's see, uh, well, I probably need to reduce my screen time. I need to make sure that what I'm watching, uh, Jesus could watch too. Uh, oh, yeah, I'll have to watch what I say, whether I'm at school or at work and, and how I say those things to people. I. Tuesdays, I guess I won't go there, I normally do, but, but I'll have to change that up. And we start going through all these things in our mind, and maybe I shouldn't be buying that stuff that I usually buy on Tuesdays. Uh, and then Jesus just looks at us and says, it's okay. The Holy Spirit has already told me everything that you do on most normal days. And, and on Tuesday, I know it all. There's nothing that's hidden. But here's what I want to do. I want to give you a chance to start fresh, to have a new beginning so that you can look back on this day and say, that was a great day, and I was with Jesus, and Jesus was with me. Go ahead and sit down, Jesus, while I get dressed. That sounds great. You see, the first verse in the passage we're going to be looking at this morning says this, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. He says, I, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you have been called to. Five times in two chapters he uses that word walk, and that word walk means the way you live, the way you conduct yourself, yourself your lifestyle is really what he's talking to, uh, to us about. And he, he says that calling, that's an invitation from God. It's like a divine summons that God gives us to join him in the life that he has prepared for us. You see, oftentimes I think we as Christians start thinking there's this dividing line between what's sacred and what is secular. But there is no such dividing line because our entire life is to be lived in light of the gospel because of who Jesus is, what he did, and how his death, burial, and resurrection should affect my daily life, not just my Sunday life, my daily life. We walk in step with him because he is Lord of all. You see, in the first three chapters of, uh, of Ephesians, we've seen where he talks about we are saved by grace through faith and about how Jesus is the one who loved us so much that he gave himself for us. And then last week, we heard about the power of God within us, the Holy Spirit, who gives us that strength that we need. But there's a shift here. And there's a shift from doctrine to duty, from belief to behavior, and then from pr principle to to practice. In essence, what we're going to look at this morning is what God wants as the new normal for his church, both for all of us as individuals, but at us as a group of, of fellow believers in the body of Christ as well. So today we're going to see three things. God desires his church 
to exhibit three distinct qualities. And they are spiritual unity, spiritual diversity, and spiritual maturity. So we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 16. So if you would, please stand with me as we read together, if you're willing and able. And uh, we'll read this passage together, Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens, that he might fulfill all things, or fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the fullness, stature of the fullness of Christ. So that we may no, no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, cunning and by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that builds itself up in love. These are God's words for, God, for today. Please be seated. So let's take uh, just a, a little while this morning and look at what God desires for his church and uh, these three distinct qualities. The first one is God desires for us to have spiritual unity. Now again, as I've mentioned, it's a consistency of what we profess and what we practice. And it's, it's on the individual basis, but it's also the group of us as believers together as the body of Christ. And that's why he says in verses 1 through 3 there, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another, eager to maintain the unity in the spirit of the bond of peace. So there are five traits that we see here that we need to be unified. And, and I want to make note right now, these are very much countercultural. They go against our culture of the day. Because our culture, the world would say, well, here are the five qualities you need. You probably need leadership, you need courage, you need planning, you need hard work, and you also need some charisma if you want to be somebody who is a, a good leader and somebody who is uh, helping out in the situation. But that's not what Paul says. There are five traits here he mentions. The first one is humility. And it's interesting because Paul, Paul takes this word that used to be a derogatory term used of the slaves who, uh, who would just accommodate and bow low to everyone, and he makes it into a term meaning lowliness, lowliness. And what that really means, it's a correct sense of ourself as we compare ourselves to the Lord God Almighty. That's what lowliness is. That's what humility is. That's what it means to be humble. We have a correct understanding of who we are as compared to who we are in comparison to God, the Lord God Almighty. So uh, Tim Keller puts it this way, the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. It is thinking of myself less because I'm concentrating on God and on Jesus Christ, his son, and the Holy Spirit who empowers me to live the life that he calls me to live. So the first trait is, uh, is that of humility. The second one is gentleness or meekness. It means mild in character or kind-hearted. Now, this doesn't mean wimpy. A lot of people think, well, if you're gentle and you're meek, then you're wimpy. That is not what that word means at all. But it means having the controlled strength in your life that God gives to you. It's a controlled strength. Then there's patience. That means long-suffering, self-restraint before proceeding. 
Uh, for me, in this area, it means holding back on the honking and restraining myself. And between the Holy Spirit and my wife, it's getting better. Being patient with other people. And then he goes on to, to give more detail. He says, bearing with one another in love. Now, this word for love is the same love that God has for us. It's agape love. It's that compassion that always has the interest of the other person in mind. It's their best interest. It's not about me. It's about the other person's best interest. Bearing with one another in, in love, he says. We need to overlook annoyances, insults, and offenses. Really? You mean Christian people can become annoying sometimes? Well, let's be honest. We've all had those people, even those who are Christians, that sometimes bug us. And it bothers us. But we need to overlook those offenses. That's why it's interesting that Peter said it this way. He said, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over what? A multitude of sins. A multitude of sins. So we need to be bearing with one another with the love that God has for us by giving that to others. And then the fifth trait is that we are eager to maintain the unity in the spirit in the bond of peace. We are eager. That word actually means we give it our best effort with God's help to maintain or keep that unity that we should have together. Now this is something that's active, not just passive. It's not like, well, you know, we'll all get along if we, if we try. No, it's each of us doing our best to try to get along with everyone else and to maintain that unity in the spirit in the bond of peace. Believe it or not, I actually know of churches, not here, but churches where there have been elders who's actually been in fistfights during a meeting about what spiritual things are going to be going on in their church. Here's a question for us. How well have you and I cooperated with the Holy Spirit to develop these traits in our lives? How would people describe us after first meeting us? Would they say, well, that person's humble or gentle or patient or uh, bearing in love and eager to maintain unity? Verses 4 through 6, and then he proceeds on. He, he's talking about what we develop personally or what the Holy Spirit actually develops in us personally. And then he proceeds to talk about the areas in the body of Christ that we can share because we are one together. And he, he talks about there, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all who is over all and through all and in all. So he talks about we're one body. There's many parts, but we're all working together. One spirit, the spirit who indwells us. One hope. Jesus calls us to live that hope in this life and in the next. And that word for hope is interesting. You know, I, 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 hope, I hope to win the lottery and win a million dollars. That's not the kind of hope he's talking about here. He's talking about the hope that really has the desire of good with a great expectation of receiving it. So it's a realistic hope. One Lord, one leader, one sovereign ruler, one faith, one truth that was delivered to us through God's word, one baptism, one opportunity to identify with and unite with Christ in death, burial, resurrection through being immersed. And one God and Father who is over all, through all, and in all. You see, we're all created in the image of God, aren't we? We all reflect his image. And if you notice through this list here, the Trinity or the Godhead is mentioned. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit all together in the oneness and the unity we experience here in the church. That's why it's interesting whenever I go on mission trips, whether, whether it's to Mexico or Haiti or Eastern Europe or Israel, doesn't matter. There's always a oneness in Christ there. Even though we have different languages, different backgrounds, and different areas of brokenness in our lives. Only God can create that kind of a unity in a church. And no other organization or group can have that. So God desires, first of all, as church to exhibit uh, the, the, the distinct quality of spiritual unity. But secondarily, secondly... He wants us to have spiritual diversity. Now, oftentimes, when we hear this word diversity, we think of ethnic backgrounds, don't we? That is not what he's talking about here uh, because he's talking about diversity for serving, which means we have various roles or gifts to use to serve the Lord and his people. 
Now remember, unity is not necessarily the sameness. We don't all have to be the same. We can have different ideas, be different, but still have that unity because we're working toward the same purpose in Jesus Christ. Let's look at verses 7 through 10. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. And in saying ascended, what does it mean? But he also descended to the lower regions, that is the earth. Who descended, he who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. He says, but grace was given to us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Grace is the one word for the gospel, the good news about Jesus through his death, burial, and resurrection, that we have hope. It's undeserved and it's unearned. It is a gift from God. And notice he talks about the measure of his gift. That's where he offers salvation to all of us who are sinful and unworthy people. None of us deserve that. And what is the gift that he gives? It's Jesus himself. And he, through him we have the capacity to receive forgiveness and have eternal life because of what Jesus did. Verses 8 through 10, he, he talks about, and he actually uh, takes part of Psalm chapter 60, or Psalm 68 and uses part of that chapter when he talks about the victory uh, of the conquering king leading this procession where, where he's showing the victory of authority over his enemies, in this case, death, Satan, and the grave. You see, he recounts what happened. Jesus left heaven. He was with God in, in heaven during creation. He leaves heaven. He's born of a woman. He descends to the earth. He lives and teaches us all about God, who he is, what he wants for us. He is a perfect and sinless man who offers himself as the sacrifice for all sinners. He becomes our atonement. He bought us back. He redeems us and brings us back to the Lord God Almighty. He frees us from sin, dies, and three days later he raises from the dead rises up and he is resurrected then he appears to the apostles and to peter and, and a bunch of other people over 500 people see jesus alive and then what's he do he ascends back into heaven where he right now he's seated at the right hand of the throne of god the position of power and authority jesus was willing to do all that for you and for me and, verse 11, it says, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. The apostles were those who witnessed his resurrection. They have a direct commission from Jesus himself. Uh, they could perform miracles, all kinds of amazing things these apostles could do. The prophets were those who spoke forth the inspired message from the Lord God. And then you have the evangelists, those who proclaimed the good news as they traveled around. And then you have shepherd teachers, and these two are joined together here by the way the, the construction is in the original language. They care for people and then instruct them. Anybody here watch the uh, basketball tournament that just happened here a few weeks ago? Yeah, it was interesting, wasn't it? If you notice on those teams, a lot of those teams, basketball teams, they have people called guards. What do the guards do? They bring the ball up, they're good ball handlers, and then they direct the plays and they, they distribute the ball to different people. And then usually every team has what's called the center too. That's the big person who stands down low and hopefully can get a lot of rebounds and, and they work the ball into that person. You see, each person on the team has a different job to perform. And that's what he's talking about with these leaders that he mentions here. And what's their purpose? Verse 12 says, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Who are saints? That word for saints, actually the root word is the same as the word holy. They are the holy ones, the ones who are set apart for God's plans. And it's every Christian. So turn to somebody next to you and say, hello, saint. <laughs> Let's try that again. Look at somebody next to you and turn to them and say, well, hello, saint. All right, thank you. All right, just want to make sure you're still with me here. Yeah, they're saints. We are all saints. If we belong to Jesus Christ, then we are a saint. We are a saint because he has made us holy. And notice, what, what is these leaders are supposed to do, these, especially the shepherds and teachers, as, as we look at it today? 
Well, they are to equip the saints for work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. That word for equip means to prepare or make fully ready. It's actually a word that's used to set a broken bone or to mend a net. And that's what the leaders are to do is to equip the saints for works of ministry because all of us are supposed to do the work. It's not just the paid staff at the church who are supposed to be doing the work. It's each of us. Each of us. And we build up the body, the whole body, the church is built together. That's why Paul said it this way when he was writing to the Christians. Now there are a variety of gifts, but there's the same spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it's also the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for what purpose? The common good. For the common good. I like this quote. It's interesting. We can do nothing greater with our life than invest it for the glory of our Redeemer and the Lord as we serve Him and serve others. That's one of the greatest things we can do. But let's be honest, many of us get distracted, don't we? We get distracted with sports, with family, with work, with hobbies, with the lake's attraction to us in the summer, with kids' activities. We get distracted sometimes. Paul Tripp said it this way, Your life is much bigger than a good job, an understanding spouse, and non-delinquent kids. It's a good way to put it, isn't it? It's bigger than beautiful gardens, nice vacations, and fashionable clothes. In reality, you are a part of something immense, something that began before you were born and will continue after you die. God is rescuing fallen humanity, transporting, or transporting them into his kingdom and progressively changing them into his likeness. And he wants you to be a part of that. That's why we're talking about this this morning. God wants you to be a part of that. All the abilities that he has given to you as an individual are important for the body of Christ together to function and accomplish all God wants. So God desires his church to exhibit three qualities, spiritual unity, spiritual diversity for service, and then thirdly, spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity. He gets to the second half there in verse 13 uh, of the purpose of the apostles and the prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers. And he says, verse 13, until we attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We attain the unity of faith and the knowledge. That word for knowledge there is personal experience of the Son of God. It's not just knowing a little bit about Jesus, it's actually personally knowing Him and experiencing a relationship with Him. To mature manhood, that's where we're spiritually adulting, okay, instead of spiritual kidding <laughs> or being a spiritual child. Spiritual adulting, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now, what is the fullness of Christ? How do we experience that? What's he talking about here? He's talking about the sum total of the qualities of Jesus being lived out and exhibited through us. Here's a question. Who's the most godly person you have ever personally met? Who is that? I know for me, one of the most godly men that I've ever met is Woody Church. Many of you knew him as well. He went to be with the Lord just a few years back. Just an amazing man of God who exhibited these qualities that we've been talking about and reading about this morning. You see, we're only going to be completely like Jesus when we get face to face with him in heaven. But our goal should be to cooperate with the Holy Spirit so that he can develop that humility, that gentleness, that patience, that forbearance and love, and that eagerness to maintain the unity within each of us. Then in verses 14 through 16, he gives us some, some great insights <clears throat> excuse me, about the evidence of maturity in our life. He says, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. One of those words actually means crooked dice, using crooked or fixed dice. Rather, he says, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in him in every way who is the head into Christ, 
from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so it builds itself up in love. So again, he's talking about us as individuals, but us as the corporate body of Christ together. Now, I don't know about you, but I have this question for all of us to ask this morning and answer. Would you like to be more like Jesus, yes or no? Hopefully the answer is yes. So how is that possible? Let's look at some of these evidences of maturity uh, or of, of fullness. The first one is that we are like Jesus. That means our thoughts, our words, and our deeds, our behaviors show, show everybody else around us and show us ourselves that we would like to be like Jesus was in his pursuit of God the Father. We're allowing the Spirit to guide us. We are into the Word of God where he talks to us. We spend time in prayer and conversation with him, and we fellowship with others who are striving to become more and more like Jesus as well. So we are like Jesus. That's one evidence of maturity in our life. Another one he talks about here is doctrinal stability. In verse 14, he says, uh, he says, so that we are no longer to be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Tossed to and fro like children. And that word for children is the word for infant. Now, anybody know what this thing is? You recognize that? Yeah, it's a bib. Okay? Now, it's, it's a little too small for me. Or, yeah, it's too small for me. But do you know there are some people walking around who claim to know Jesus who all they do is wear a spiritual bib all the time because all they take in is milk. Paul talked to those people. He said, instead of just taking in spiritual milk and being a spiritual babe, you should be taking the spiritual meat. And I should be talking to you about deeper things beyond the basic things. See, we have to be careful because that word there for children is actually a word for infants. These infants that are tossed to and fro in the waves, tossed back and forth. We have to be cautious. Watch out for these tricky screams and cra- schemes and crafty people. They have phrases like this, you just do you. Or why don't you just live your truth? Or follow your heart. Those are some uh, well-known lies that are being propagated today. You see, we have to be careful that we don't fall for things like this, like, oh, all religions basically lead the same place. Or just be a good person and you'll go to heaven. Or the Bible is just one of many good religious books. See, those are some of the deceitful lies that come directly from Satan. He says we have to be careful that we're not easily swayed by these things, by these crafty people who make it almost sound like it may actually come from the Bible when it doesn't. Be careful. And then another mark of maturity, he says uh, in verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love. And the way that's worded in the original language, it, it should just read truthing in love. Truthing in love. Because we're always speaking the truth. We speak unveiled reality, whatever is truth, and knows how do we do it? In love. You ever known people who are really good at speaking truth? But not so good at speaking truth in love? We as Christians are encouraged here in this passage to do both. We don't give half-truths. We give the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but what? The truth. We are completely honest. Christians should be known by being completely honest. Now, there are a couple different uh, jobs that are known for not exactly being totally honest, okay, and truthful and upfront. They are car sales and sometimes attorneys. Now, I know we have a lot of attorneys here. So it is reassuring to me to know that I, I actually have a good friend who is not an attorney who happens to be a Christian, he says he is a Christian who happens to be an attorney. And there's a big, big difference. Big difference. So you can work in, in jobs that are perhaps not well known for truth as a Christian and still give the whole truth and speak it in love. That's another form uh, of evidence showing our maturity. 
And then the, the fourth way of, of knowing that is by serving in the body of Christ. Serving in the body of Christ. You see, what we need to do is put down this bib and instead take up the towel. You ever see guys in fancy restaurants? <laughs> they walk around like this, right? So they can help you out. So they can be of service to you. Think about Jesus. Jesus washed the disciples' feet the night before he was killed. He picked up the towel. And he said, you should also serve one another this way. You see, he talks in this passage about each part doing its work. And that, that word for, for work is the energy we receive from God. And if one part of the body isn't working, have you noticed how that affects the whole body? Okay, If your sinuses get filled up, does that affect the rest of your body? Yeah. If you break just even a little finger, it affects your body in a lot of amazing ways. We are knitted and to, together, he says, joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped. So every person is important. And then the, the last way, the, the evidence of maturity, is by seeing measurable growth. Measurable growth. Now, when I want to do some woodworking, I, I use this measure. It's called a tape measure. And that word for measure is the word from which we get the term in Greek, metric. What metrics do you use at work to measure whether or not you're being successful in what you're doing? You see, this is in inches and in portions of an inch so that I know where to cut. And remember, you always measure how many times? Measure twice and cut once. You don't want to do it the other way. But it's measurable. There's a chart that we're going to put up here. And uh, it's, it's a continuum. And if, if you saw a line going straight across there where it says selfish to selfless. And uh, the, I had a friend who shared this with me years ago. He said, this is all about complete obedience and being yielded to God's will. You see, when we come to know Christ, where are we? We're over here on selfish, aren't we? Where's Jesus? Right over top of that arrow above the selfless. And the goal should be to go from selfless, excuse me, selfish, to becoming selfless. So here's a question. Where are you on the line right now? Where would you put yourself if you had to put a dot on this line saying this is where I am? Where would you put it? Here's an even better question. Where would God put you? Where would God put me? Where would he put us on that line? Because he knows our heart. He knows everything about us. Where would he put us? Anybody who's ever had a sibling probably had one of them say something like this. Oh, why don't you just grow up? Just grow up. Become mature. We need to exhibit those ways of showing that we are maturing in Christ. So God desires his church to exhibit three distinct qualities, spiritual unity, spiritual diversity for service, and then spiritual maturity. So as we close out this morning, Paul starts out this, this passage, this chapter. He says, Paul, a prisoner for the Lord. And he makes it known that it can be costly to follow Jesus. And it is sometimes. But it's well worth it. It's well worth it. You see, the body of Christ, the church, is not just another organization in the community. It is a living organism, which is different than a lot of the clubs that we belong to. It's living. It's individual parts letting the Spirit of God transform them into the image of Christ. How many of you are parents? Raise your hand if you would, please. All right. Yeah, a lot, a lot of parents here. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we love our kids, don't we? And we enjoy them. Well, most of the time, let's be honest. Most of the time we enjoy our kids. And we, we love them. We care for them. And, and you ever look at them and say, man, there are times where I wish you could just stay like you are right now. Where, where you would be like that. We don't want them to grow up too fast. Some of us even keep track of their heights, you know, maybe on a, a, a doorway or a chart or something like that. But here, I want to show you a picture of, uh, of one of my kids. This is my son. And he was somewhere around three, four years old. Cute little guy. Just a lot of fun to be with. In fact, some of you actually do him 
at, at that age. There are a few folks here who knew him when he was like that. But you know, as much as I enjoyed him and as much fun as he was at that age, I still wanted him to grow up. Because I wanted him to come to know Christ and to be able to, to know Jesus as his Lord and his Savior. And thankfully, he did do that. Well, this is what he looks like now. That's what he looks like now. He, uh, now, uh, that, that's a military picture, so of course you can't smile. You know, he's a lot more fun than this picture shows, even today. But he's currently in Iraq, serving our country there. And his birthday is tomorrow, he turns 32. So he has grown up. And I'm very pleased that he knows Jesus. Now, he's not a perfect young man. He's like his dad. He's imperfect. But, you know, I really love this man. And I love his four siblings, too. But God loves him even more than I do. More than I ever could. That's like God loves you more than you, anybody else could ever love you. There is no way we, we can be loved as much by any human being as God loves us. So here's a question for us this morning. Are you a child of God? Now we're all creations of God, but we're only a child of God when we're adopted back into his family. After we acknowledge our sin, we recognize that we are sinners in need of a Savior. We, we believe in Jesus Christ as God's Son. We recognize and we, we believe in our heart that he died on the cross for us and that he rose again. He's alive today. And we're willing to commit our life completely to Jesus and surrender everything to him. And we trust in him and him alone to save us. Then we can be adopted back into his family. It's like Jesus, that word for urge there that's used in this passage means to call somebody up alongside of you. It's like Jesus is putting his arm around each of us this morning saying, I love you. I sacrifice myself for you. The Bible says even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I gave myself for you, and I died and rose again, and I want you to be a part of my family. That's what Jesus is saying to each of us this morning. I want you to be a part of that. That is possible. And just like we started out with the illustration of opening the door for Jesus, open your heart. Let Jesus in. Let him come in and be the Lord of your life. You'll never regret it never. Paul wrote to Titus and said this, the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and live a self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age, waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Zealous for good works. So if you haven't yet become a child of God and you want to talk to us, we'll have people who will be uh, up here this morning. Uh, or you can grab any one of the staff members. We would love to talk to you about yielding your life to Jesus and knowing him as Lord and Savior. But if you're already in the body of Christ, you're already in the family of God, you're already a part of the church, are you growing to be like Jesus? Are you closer to being like Jesus now than you were a year ago? God's desire for his church is that we are spiritually unified, that we have spiritual diversity in service, and that we are spiritually mature people. Show God the depth of your love. By cooperating with the Spirit of God. Get rid of the bib, grab the towel, and join Jesus on the greatest adventure of life. Answer his call on your life, his summons to come to him. Let's pray. Father God, we do just thank you so much that you give us the call to follow you. 
to love you, to be loved, to, to Father, uh, thanks for the opportunity. We don't deserve it. We can't earn it. But you have given us the opportunity to be brought back into your family, to be forgiven of our sins, to be redeemed, cleansed of all of our unrighteousness, whatever it is. Thank you for that possibility through Jesus. And Lord, help those of us who know Jesus to want to grow, to show you our love, to become more and more like Jesus through the help and the, and the strength of the Holy Spirit. Father, we can't do it on our own strength. We need your help. There's a lot of things that we need to fight against in this life. They're, they're, some of them are easy, some of them are tough, but we know you will help us. So Father, just mold us and shape us into the individuals and into the body of Christ here at Stones that you want us to be. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we praise you. Amen. Well, let's stand and sing in response to the word of God being preached this morning.
was a beautiful reminder for the love that Christ has for us. That the decision that we make is not only beautiful and a privilege to follow God, but more importantly, we get to step into that obedience and that relationship with Him. And for those of us who have been walking with Him for a long time, I pray that this song would walk with you out these doors. That as you read God's Word and you listen to His, His messages for you this week, that you would abide in Him that you would find a greater relationship with him, that you would have a truly a new beginning and a new life and something deeper and more purposeful and that you would take that out from this place. And so it's in the message today, it's in the love of the Lord that you are known and you are loved and you are sent. We will see you next week. And if you need prayer, don't forget to come see us up here.